What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Disc Golf Nerd Plastic Podcast. It's been a little while since I posted an episode. Sorry about that. It's just been... It's tough to find the time sometimes to sit down and uh, talk for a half hour, 45 minutes, hour, whatever. Um, it's not all that easy to do, and I usually end up doing it on days that I have off, such as today. I got a cup of coffee. It's my day off. Um, my wife is out of the house. And let's ramble about some plastic. You might hear some background noise. I got the window open. It's a, a nice, cool fall morning out here in the Pacific Northwest, and I like to get that fresh air coming in while I hang out. So uh, bear with me. Provide a little ambiance in the background. I don't have like a recording studio or anything re remotely like that that I use. Actually, when I do voiceovers and stuff um, for the stuff that I want to sound the best I can, like the uh, stuff I sent to the Disc Golf Pro Tour for the broadcasts or my Smashbox reviews or anything where I'm doing a dedicated voiceover on my um, good microphone like the one I'm using right now, I will actually take it into my bedroom, close all the doors, and I put a a pillow up on the window it's a really small bedroom and then I do it in there because that's like the closest thing I have to any type of sound controlled environment um, at my disposal okay what's new what do we have to talk about okay I have finally got a chance to put out some new reviews lately hopefully you guys have noticed that I've kind of gotten back on track a little bit I still have a couple more in the can um, that are ready to go I just have to post those up once I'm ready to release them Posted the ESP Force review today. Um, great disc, great new plastic blend from Discraft. Discraft might be a topic we touch on a little bit later as well. Also posted, what else did I post recently? A few other things. The Stego review finally went up. Unbelievably overstable disc. Um, hopefully you guys enjoyed that review. Um, I feel a little bit weird about it. Um because it's a really long video and I talk a lot about the disc and I kind of say that I wouldn't use it and I don't think it's really that necessary to use on the course. I feel like that might rub people the wrong way who do carry it and do like it for certain shots. But yeah, maybe I didn't make that clear enough in the video. If you use it and you like it, that's awesome. I just don't think I need something that overstable um, because I don't. I've played a lot of rounds with nothing more overstable than an anchor um, at the top end for my approach discs and then my caltrops are usually plenty stable for my short range shots as well so that thing is just unbelievably overstable um, but really fun disc and uh, super unique and interesting flyer definitely glad I tested it and it's a good disc to have in the uh, in the playlist of reviews what else um, so I have two different things that I uh, have just posted recently, the Latitude 64 core bag review. Um, we're going to talk about that a little bit later as well. And also, um, I'm about to post a video. I actually posted it quickly, and then I realized that there was a mistake in it. Um, so I took it back down. I'm going to repost that sometime over this weekend, which is a look at all the features and design of the Rovic RV1D disc golf cart. Proactive Sports Disc Golf, PASDiscGolf.com sent me that thing to test and review. I've not had a chance to actually play around with it yet, but I did film a uh, look at all the features and just based on my observations, show you how it works, how you attach the bag, all that kind of stuff. Um, and the thing really has it all. It has all the different things that you need. Drink holder... Um, a cooler, a seat, it has a little compartment where you can put your scorecard and your pencils or anything else you want easy access to, um, has a dedicated umbrella holder that you can screw in, put a golf umbrella, stand underneath it while you walk the cart, keep your bag dry, keep yourself dry, so it's a pretty sweet rig, it's a three-wheeled um, golf cart that is redesigned to carry a disc golf bag. Also very cool in my opinion that some of these uh, golf manufacturers are seeing value in the disc golf market and kind of altering some of their products or bringing products to the market that are disc golf specific. I think that's really cool. Um, a lot of people um, kind of rig or modify one of those three-wheeled golf carts to carry a disc golf bag and it makes all the sense in the world for a manufacturer to do that from the factory kind of reimagine their design and rethink it. How can we make this so that people can buy it and just hang their bag on it straight away and get all the benefits of a cart that pushes on its own or uh, not that stands on its own rather. It doesn't like have the ability to tip over. Um, like my Zuka, I love my Zuka to death, but occasionally um, the entire thing will tip over while you're, uh, while you're dragging it or it'll just kind of get knocked over because it doesn't um, balance onto itself unless it's standing upright. So if it starts to lean backwards, it can fall over. This thing with three wheels, a little bit more sturdy. That's what I'm trying to get at here. Okay. 
enough about that. The Disc Golf Pro Tour finale took place in Florida, I think, last weekend. Unbelievable battle between five amazing players. We had Sexton, we had Kevin Jones, Nico LaCastro, we had uh, Chris Dickerson, and my boy Rick. Un- unforgettable battle between these guys. Everybody had got into trouble. Everybody had great shots. Everybody had terrible shots. Um, they just stayed within a few strokes of each other the entire way. Almost, I think, like a dozen lead changes throughout the round. Um, incredible battle. It was just so entertaining to watch and such a cool format. That kind of harkens back to the old World Championship Final Nines. And to be honest, I never really liked the idea of the Final Nine. I feel like I kind of have re rethought that after this event because... It was so cool to have only those players, that one card, be in contention for the win. And everybody else is there just watching them. There's no other cards. There's no chase card where somebody could, you know, play lights out and jump up and win from the chase card, which almost happened at Worlds this year. Um, It's those players. It's that card. Somebody from that card is going to be the champion. And it was really exciting. It was very cool to have that one card, and it's winner take all. It was very interesting. Um, and really exciting, really amazing round that I uh, thoroughly enjoyed the live coverage of that round. It's just un- unbelievable. The amount of drama um, and how close it was coming down to just a couple of strokes at the end was amazing. The thing that is coming out of this incredible battle, unfortunately, is a lot of discussion about the situation involving Nate Sexton's drive on, I believe, hole 15, the island hole, with the railroad ties. Um, from what I understand, the railroad tie was removed months ago in order to mow the grounds and was not replaced at that time. Um, so there's a gap at the back of the island that Nate Sexton unfortunately skipped out of on his drive. Um, one aspect of this whole situation that hasn't really come up, because it's kind of irrelevant, but is, I, I mean, it's not completely irrelevant, is that Nate Sexton played it really far deep into the backside of the island. Had he got closer to the basket, it wouldn't have been an issue. But he played it with a driver um, all the way into the backside of the island, and he scooted out through that gap. Now, it's frustrating that the gap was there, because if the railroad tie is there, I think it's very likely he hits it, because it was a very low, kind of hovercrafty sliding skip, and I think he hits the railroad tie and stays in the island pretty easily. Would he have made the putt under those circumstances? Maybe, maybe not. He ended up hitting the putt when they actually played a provisional from where he was. He took his meter in, saying that maybe the line was the back side of the railroad tie. That's the only way he could have possibly, possibly been in. He takes the meter from there, hits the putt, then he goes back and plays from the drop zone. The official call comes back from Steve Dodge that he was out of bounds, and the score that he played from the from the drop zone um, is the official score that goes on the scorecard. The problem now is that there was, A, there was no official on the card, which I think is a huge blunder. I love the Disc Golf Pro Tour. I try to support them as much as I can. I'm slightly involved with the tour with uh, making small reviews for the broadcast for the last couple events. It's nothing major at all. I'm honored to be part of it in any way. But I try to support this, this tour. I truly believe that the Disc Golf Pro Tour is extremely important and is taking our sport to the next level and accomplishing what it wants to. But I think it's a huge blunder that there was no official walking with that card. Where was Steve? Why was Steve not there? There's only one card on the entire property that's playing for the win. The culmination of the entire tour of just hundreds and hundreds of man hours of work and time and effort and energy going into everything culminating with this one moment. These four, five players battling for the win, for the title. There's nobody there to um, officiate in an official capacity, I thought that was a big, I think that's a big problem, and I think that will be rectified <clears throat> very much going forward. I understand if it's like a, a normal event, you know, and you have a full field of players out there, you can't put an official on every single card, and it's kind of strange to put an official on the lead card and not the third card, you know what I mean? But under these circumstances where there's five players on one card, and they were the only ones competing at that time... Um, uh, you know, you got to have an official out there for that uh, in case anything comes up. Um, so there's no question about it whatsoever. Anyway, the other problem is that the railroad tie wasn't there. It should have been there. And there was no line painted. But here's what I here's my official stance on this. I think he was out of bounds. Under the circumstances, I think it was pretty clear he was out of bounds. The only way 
he would have been inbounds is if the line was connected from the back corners of the outer edge of the railroad tie. The reason I think that makes absolutely no sense is that puts whatever the diam- whatever the width of a railroad tie is, whether it's a foot or whatever, that puts that part of the line a foot behind the entire rest of the circle. You know what I mean? The, the rest of the circle is clearly being defined by the front edge of those railroad ties. I don't believe a disc coming to rest on top of the railroad tie would have been deemed in bounds. I'm not sure. But if that's not in bounds, then Nate clearly was not either. I think if there was a painted line there, the only the only place that line could have been that makes any sense to me personally is across the front two corners, therefore keeping the, the entire circle in line with itself. I hope that makes sense verbally without any type of visual, um, any kind of visual representation. But anyway... It was an unfortunate situation, an incredible battle. Had the railroad tie been there, Nate could have just ended up taking a two there, or probably 100% at worst a three, unless something horrible happened and he hit the tray and rolled back to the edge and missed another one or had a spit out or something like that. He may, he, If he makes the island, it's basically at worst a three most of the time. And uh, yeah, it was just unfortunate the way it went down. I... Um, I'm a huge Rick fan. You guys know that. I don't hide it here on the channel. I think he could have won if his putting was a little cleaner that round. Um, He also made a big mistake coming down the stretch and throwing, hanging out early, hysering out um, with, I believe, a harp, going for the layup on uh, the par four towards the end there and ending up out of bounds. That was a huge mistake. Um, He could have still been in contention leading up to that if uh, if he didn't do that. That was a big problem, but he also missed some putts. All that being said, I, I like all these guys. And it was cool to go into a, a round with five players competing for a title, a big title. And I could feel I could feel good about anybody who would have taken it down. You know, um, there are not a lot of players that I don't really like and kind of don't root for. I'm not going to go into who those players might be. But it's nice to have a, a card full of players that I like all competing and like, yeah, anybody who wins this is going to be rad. I don't have to like, um, yeah, worry about it so much. All that being said, I was kind of pulling for Nico towards the end there. He had the lead and it's been so long since Nico's taken down a big event. He was playing so good and, uh, he's just a journeyman. He's been around forever. He's evolved. He's evolved a lot as a person, as a player. He's always got that crazy energy, and he's so intense, and he cares about it so much. This is his life, you know? Disc golf is his life. And uh, I was really pulling for Nico to, to pull this one out. It would have been such a shock for him to take it down. Nobody would have expected it. And uh, he was so damn close. It kind of hurt to see him come up just short at the end, missing the Mando. All that information there. Spoiler alert, if you don't know, somehow Chris Dickerson takes it down by, I believe, one or maybe two strokes in the end. Um, Nate Sexton ends up jumping into second place, I believe. Um, I'm not sure how everybody filtered out towards the end there. All I know is that Chris won. It was an incredible battle. And I think Dickerson was probably the best player on the event. He went 10 down first round, 10 down the next round. Then he set the course record at 13 under going into the finals and then won. So I think that makes sense. I think he was the best player over the event. If all of those scores counted, I think he would have won again. (laughs) Um, It's hard to say because uh, the way it works out, Ricky didn't play those earlier rounds. Uh, I don't believe Kevin played the earlier rounds, that sort of thing. Um, But really exciting format. Amazing finish to another incredible season. Oh, man. Once I get a chance to kind of sit down and unpack everything and go through my uh, go through Jomez and Central Coast and kind of refresh myself on all the different things that went down. I'll probably do another year-end award ceremony sometime in December and uh, talk about my favorite moments of the season. Um, that was a really fun episode to do last year, and I intend to do another one. I have a few things already kind of jotted down, incredible putts and shots that I've uh, taken notice of over the season. I can't wait to go back through all that stuff and start compiling um, my favorite moments and some of the some of the really bad moments and all that kind of stuff over the course of the season and uh, yeah it's been another incredible year. Um, I think a lot more parody kind of worked its way into the into the disc golf uh, tour and the whole season overall this year with Eagle coming out really hot straight at the, straight away, winning multiple NTs. Paul Macbeth asserting dominance after that and I believe establishing himself once again as the finest player 
in the world. I don't think you can really make an argument that Paul's not the best player in the world. All told, over the course of the season, Ricky had an off year for sure, admittedly, and I think I think he'll be back stronger next year. He still had some big wins, and he still had some great performances. We saw flashes of the 2017, you know, 2016 Ricky um, during this season, but just wasn't consistent enough. He would have those amazing rounds, and then he just would have a, a dud in there and end up losing by a few strokes, where if he could have just played a little bit more consistently throughout these events, he could have uh, taken down a lot more of them. Um, so a little bit disappointing season as a as a giant fan of Rick, but he'll be back, and uh, I'm still proud of the, the way he played and the, the performances he put up out there. He still did really well. Coming up just short on a couple of events, having some rough ones out there, also having some really strong performances like Utah, like uh, Masters Cup, and... Uh, yeah, Jones Bro, he did he did great, and uh, just a really exciting, tremendous season overall in the FPO division. We saw Paige Pierce come out storming and just crush the world for a number of events in a row, and then really fall off. Sarah Hokum really um, kind of turned the tables and ended up establishing herself as once again one of the finest players in her division. And uh, the argument. It's a pretty tough argument as to who had the better season, all told. I'd have to go back and look through all the numbers and all the finishes overall, but um, exciting exciting year in the FPO division as well. Okay, here's something I want to talk to you guys about. I posted the Latitude 64 core bag review, and I woke up the next morning. Actually, I posted it, I think, late that night. Like at, Sometimes if I'm still up after midnight, I'll post a video. Therefore, when everybody wakes up the next day, it's already there in the subscriptions or whatever. And uh, I woke up and I had a couple of interesting um, responses and comments on the video that I kind of caught me off guard. One of them we can kind of disregard other than to like quickly defend myself because I thought it was kind of kind of ridiculous. Um, one of the guys said, oh, it looks like we have another trilogy sellout here or something like that. And like, okay, how, how exactly am I a, a sellout for... For the trilogy, like, that makes no sense. Um, they're a sponsor, so I thank them. And I positively reviewed a product that I like and that they sent me to review. Um, so how does that exactly make me a sellout? The thing that I think that's funny, the thing that I find amusing about someone accusing me of selling out for one particular manufacturer is that I have literally reviewed more disc golf products and discs by more different manufacturers than anyone on earth. <laughs> I've reviewed hundreds of discs, almost almost 200 different discs by all kinds of different manufacturers over the years and other products and bags and carts and minis and towels and all this other stuff that I've done from all these different manufacturers. I work with different retailers. I work with different manufacturers directly. And I've literally reviewed more products by more different manufacturers than anyone else who's ever lived in the, in the sport of disc golf. And uh, it's kind of funny to accuse me of being a sellout for one. The other reason that's kind of an absurd statement is the only disc you see in full view on that review of the bag loaded down with my plastic is a Discraft putter, which is my main putter. I don't even throw all Trilogy, and I'm being accused of being like a sellout fanboy of Trilogy. Meanwhile, I putt and approach with magnets and throw thrashers out there on the course and have done for several years. So I think that's kind of hilarious. But anyway, that's just that's besides the point. I just wanted to throw out why I thought that was a funny comment. The thing that's a little bit more serious and the thing that I took a lot more seriously in terms of um, taking a step back and trying to be thoughtful about this particular piece of feedback and whether or not it had any validity was somebody said, this is not a review, it's a commercial. And uh, it kind of caught me off guard. Uh, originally, I was like a little bit snotty and I was like defensive and I was like, well, maybe I don't know the difference. And they're like, well... A review you provide counterpoints and you talk about pros and cons and I was like well I set out to make a video showing off the features and a closer look at this brand new product um, in order to help kind of help spread the word for the manufacturer and give it a, a closer look for my viewers and let them know what to expect from it the different features that it has and the things that I liked about it upon initial testing and uh, as always, I will kind of report back 
eventually, if I run into any problems, you'll likely see the bag again in my next in the bag video because I'm using it. And, uh, yeah, basically they're just, this person was saying that it's not a review, it's just a, it's just a, basically a, a glorified commercial because I didn't talk about anything negative. And <clears throat> also, I found out just as a quick aside that a lot of people took a lot of offense with the fact that I did not show the bottom of the bag. That's my bad. I'll, I'll take that one for sure. I don't think about the bottom of the bag because I use my easy cart and I also use a folding bag like stool that I use. It's the same one that Big Germ uses. It's like a little um, camping stool that opens up, has a little piece of fabric that kind of suspends across two, two poles as you open it up. It's not one of the tripod ones. It's a little um, just two piece one with two little hinges opens up and I put my bag down on top of that. I've never thought it made sense to put your bag directly on the ground in the mud and the sticks uh, that makes no sense to me so I've always used that bag stand going back several years even to the days where I was using an Innova Deluxe with the backpack straps pre backpack pre grip bag era I've been using that so basically like I, I never really think about the bottom because I'm not worried about the durability of it because I'm not throwing my bag straight down on the rocks and the mud and the sticks out there on the course um, I always have it up onto a stool, so that's my bad. That's just kind of a flaw in my t in my testing methodology and the way I go about reviewing bags that I will definitely rectify in the future if and when I review any more disc golf bags coming up, which I probably will. I will be sure to give you guys a closer look at the bottom. The, uh, the, the short story of that is, too, that there's nothing to see. It has the same rubberized material. That's on the rest of the bag. On the bottom, there's no plastic feet or anything, which I wouldn't want anyway because I feel like they just add weight and I'm not worried about the durability of the bottom of the bag because of my bag stand or my easy cart, as we talked about. So that's one other thing. But this comment about it not being a review and it being a commercial, I took I took it to heart, and I really mulled over it for basically that entire day. I believe I went out and had breakfast with my wife, and I was thinking about it the entire time. Um, is there validity to that? Is that true? Am I not doing the right thing like am I am I kind of just favorably reviewing products because of the sponsors sending them to me or is my kind of thought process that I want to just show you guys the features is that not a review is that not a valid form of review the other thing is I didn't really notice any significant downsides to the bag when I was out testing it and I'm not going to like make up negative things or look for something negative to bring up in a three and a half, four minute review when I didn't qu quite notice it during testing. One thing that I did not bring up in the review that I could have that was uh, a negative that I noticed during testing, but I wasn't really sure how to address it in a, in a kind of a succinct manner is that the, the way the water bottle holders work, they have zippers on them so you can use gear or water depending on what you want to do. One of my bottles that I was trying to use in that is like a really tall, 40 ounce, very heavy um, water bottle that you've probably seen in some of my videos. It's a like a, I forget the brand name, but it's like a 50-50, that's what it is. It's a insulated water bottle. It's very heavy and it's very tall. So it's basically the same diameter as the 32 ounce Tempercraft that I've been using, um, but it's another few inches taller. And the way it's so tall, it kind of tilts on an angle and it ended up working those zippers down and fell out of the bag um, off of the cart at one point during my round. That I feel like was more that the bottle didn't work very well with the bag than a true design flaw with the bag because I feel like a shorter bottle like again the, the 32 ounce Tempercraft or a Nalgene wouldn't hang out of the pocket enough to really put as much tension on those zippers but you can see what I'm saying it's a difficult thing to represent in the video um, in kind of a short and intelligible manner with the overall presentation that I was going for for this particular video I'm trying to step up my game and have it be more of like film separately audio done separately to the point a little more crisp rather than just tripod camera here's the bag here's me rambling for as long as it takes one one take and um just best i can get it within a few tries and then post it like i always do um so 
I, I gave this a lot of thought, and um, I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure. Is it valid just to show the features of a product and talk about the things I liked about it? Is that still a valid form of review, or should I name that something else? Should I not say, hey, this is my review? Maybe I should just say, kind of like I did with the Rovic cart, I made it perfectly clear I did not test it, and I said, hey, I have not tested this yet, not really a review, this is just to show you, show you guys the features and how it all works, give you a closer look at it. Should I just come right out up front and say that? Would that make it better? Would that make it more more useful and more transparent to the disc golf community. I'm not going to say that I'm lying to you guys to try to fabricate good things about a bag that I think is garbage just because Latitude 64 sent it to me. That's not how this works. Um, if I did that ever, I don't think I would be at the point that I am at now. Now, I know I'm no big deal. I have right around 6,000 subscribers right now, and I've posted a ton of content, and I get good feedback on it. I have viewers. I appreciate all that stuff. But I know I'm no big deal. I'm very small fish in the YouTube scene, you know. Like it's it's nothing really compared to a lot of, of other channels. But within the disc golf community, I have put the time in, I put the work in, and uh, I do have the sponsors now that send me these products. I don't think that that really changes the way that I'm reviewing them, but maybe it does more than I realize. And that's kind of what I had stepped back to think about, like. Am I being overly positive because I want to support the people who support me? You know, that's the other part of this equation is that like, I want to, I want to provide content that you guys like to watch. I want to provide content that's useful to the disc golf community. I also like being part of helping the manufacturers of disc golf connect with their kind of uh, customer base. So I like to show off products that are new, that I think are interesting, that I think are valid, and connect my viewership with those products in an effort to help everybody. And I think that's cool, and I enjoy that role. And I'd like to, at some point, I would love to be able to develop that into a professional kind of situation with someone where I could be part of that. I think I'm good at that. I have a lot of experience helping people understand what features of a, of a product might be beneficial to them and in what ways and that sort of thing. So I like that role. And when I reach out to Latitude 64 and I reached out to Anthony and they immediately hooked me up with this beautiful brand new bag that I, I was interested in already. And I think the design is cool. And then I get it and I test it and it works out great. And I like the, the top pocket is nice. The access to the main compartment is great. It's super lightweight. I think it's a sharp looking bag, all that stuff. I'm excited about it. I've only had it for like a week or two. I, I get around in with it. I post the video. I mostly talk about the good things about it. Is that invalid? Is that not worth doing? Like, is that a disservice to the community? I don't necessarily think so, but um, yeah, I gave it a lot of thought. Um, I highly doubt whoever that person was is gonna hear this, but if they do, um, I do genuinely appreciate the feedback. I don't necessarily agree, but it definitely let me kind of step back and re-examine the way I approach these things. And maybe I am getting to the point where I, maybe I am a little too um, kind of generous with my, not necessarily praise, but just like, maybe I am a little overly positive of certain products. Um, because I want to be beneficial to the manufacturer and I want to be beneficial to the people who watch it and I want to kind of blend that together and I appreciate the people who support me and allow me to do the make the content that I want to make and that I enjoy making um, I appreciate those people and I want to support them because they support me um, but maybe I need to just be a little bit more um, transparent a little bit more neutral and the way I approach these products just kind of for the good of the integrity of the channel overall. But again, I don't feel as though I'm lying or misleading anyone by posting a mostly positive review of a product that I enjoy genuinely and think has good features to it that I liked in the first place and was confirmed to enjoy and find use for 
once I actually started testing the products. So that's a lot of information there. I just kind of wanted to walk through that philosophically with you guys. Here's what I'd like you to do. Let me know in the comments below. Is it still a valid form of review just to show off a product and walk through the features, some of the things that I noticed about it, whether those are all positive or a mix of positive or negative? Is that important to you? Is that 100% necessary for me to come up with bad things to say about something for a review to be uh, valid or useful to you? Or do you like the kind of overview um, of, hey, here's a closer look at this product you haven't seen in person. Maybe you don't have a local shop. You know, that's kind of why I make a lot of these reviews and stuff is that you don't have the ability to hold 200 different discs wherever you live or all these different bags and different things that I've reviewed or the easy cart. So I'm trying to show it to you in detail and give you the closest you can get to um, having a chance to see it for yourself in person before you make the decision to spend your hard-earned money on that product. That's kind of the, the thing I go for. Is that still valid or should I wait to thoroughly test a product for a long period of time and then kind of come back with it? Here's the problem with that though, is that there's a brand new bag on the market, Latitude 64, the incentive for them to send it to me is that I'm going to show it off in a timely fashion with and share that with my viewership. Therefore, helping them spread the word about their new product. Now, if I take this thing and I wait to play six months worth of disc golf with it, and then I posted the review, does anybody care at that point? Is that still value? Does that still provide value to a manufacturer? Yeah, maybe they're going to have this product for years to come. But at the same time, a lot of the reasons why they want to send you a disc or something like that is because it's new and new products are always what's most exciting and that's when you're most likely to sell them is when they first hit the market so that's part of the equation as well um, but yeah let me know do you think an overview look at the features closer look at a product is valid is that still a review in your mind or does it have to be a pro and con after a designated period of testing like I played around with the bag I carried it I carried it I played around with it I messed around with it I loaded it up full of plastic I played with it to make sure all the zippers were nice and like that I felt the way the discs go in and out you know I, I it's not like I just got it took it out of the box and turned the camera on you know um, I did that the first day I got it as like a mail call which I always do then I tested it I checked it out more thoroughly and then I posted the secondary review and if I continue to use this bag, which I probably will, and anything significantly negative comes up during my further use of it, I will post an addendum and let you guys know what happened and why. And I think it's fair to trust that I would do that because I, I try to be really honest and open with you guys as much as I as much as I can and as much as makes sense um, for all parties involved. So. Anyway, let me know what you think about that. I'd be interested to hear um, your opinion as my viewership. I feel like the people who listen to these episodes are probably amongst my more core um, viewership, and uh, I really appreciate you guys. Let me know what you think, um, and uh, maybe I can kind of improve the quality of things going forward and make them that much more useful. All right, so finally, for this episode, free agency is a topic that's been coming up a lot. With the season over now, we're starting to look towards the end of the year. Towards the end of the year, contracts run out and players start making their decisions on where they're going to play disc golf next season in terms of their sponsorship and what team and what plastic they're going to be throwing. Always exciting to see where people go and how the game develops in, along those lines. And I think this year is going to be a big one, guys. Um, Chris Dickerson was uh, definitely part of the discussion a lot of people thought he might move somewhere else as one of our top up-and-coming players chris logged like 25 wins this season alone including the disc golf pro tour championship now he mostly took down a lot of those wins in his local area but he's still playing against high level players with a lot of experience in the open division he rattled off like 11 wins in a row the, the, the dude is an absolute stud player incredibly consistent on the greens and off the tee and he's really just solid all the way through so people were thinking chris might go somewhere else and somebody might come splash some cash for to take him off of prodigy that did not happen they kept him he's re-signed for another two-year deal kevin jones is another name that is definitely 
up there in terms of somebody who's likely to move on to another team. Um, I could easily see Kevin Jones being taken onto Team Discmania, maybe Innova, maybe Dynamic Discs. I think he'd be a good fit there as well. And I think they would do a tremendous job of promoting him in a way that Pro Discus, in my opinion, has unfortunately completely failed to do. Pro Discus has done absolutely no promotion of Kevin Jones as a very talented, up-and-coming player, incredible power, impeccable form, probably, arguably the best putter thrower on tour right now. It's You'd have to say it's somewhere between him and James Conrad. His shots with the jokery are just unbelievable. Just so good with a putter, it's ridiculous. And he's throwing putters off of tees that I would be throwing a distance driver all the time, all over the country, and doing it incredibly well. Kevin Jones... No in-the-bag video from Kevin. No demo of plastic that he likes. No, here's my three favorite discs from Pro Discus and why I like them. Here's a look at the profile. Here's me throwing them. No YouTube channel. No tips with Kevin. No following him on the road. Nothing. No promotion whatsoever of this up-and-coming talented player who's got all the skill to be one of the best players. He's already one of the best players in the world. One of. He has all the skill to be in the top three, top five players in the world as he continues to develop his game. Pro Discus has nothing for him. It frustrates me so much as somebody who's had a $100 camcorder that I got on Craigslist and I've made hundreds of videos to share with the disc golf community and then a major manufacturer who's making... All these discs, sponsoring players in Europe and the United States, and you can't make a video with your top player where he throws some discs. You don't have an in-the-bag video. You got nothing. You can't. One guy with a camcorder is too much to ask. So frustrating. And it's a disservice to Kevin. Let's take Dynamic Discs, for example. Here comes the trilogy sellout again. <laughs> Look what they've done for their players. Look at how much more known their players are based on the content that they provide. It's not rocket science to put out videos with your top players on social media. That's not a hard thing to figure out. And they've made players like AJ and Eric Oakley and Tina, they've helped them become popular, known people within the community. That provides value. These players are basically their own brand. Look what Ricky has done unto himself and with the help of Latitude 64 and from Dynamic Discs as well, the promotion that they've put behind him, he's become his own brand. He's got SakiBomb.com, he's got the Saki Box, he's got all the different stamps, he's running the Saki, Saki Bomb tournaments and all that stuff. Like, that's what you want to do if you're going to be a long-term kind of viable entity within the sport, and it frustrates me to see somebody with so much talent just get wasted on a company that doesn't put the effort in to, to do what should be done, as far as I'm concerned. Maybe that's harsh. Can you name me anything that Kevin's throwing other than the Jokery? I don't know the other discs that he has. I've reviewed more discs than anybody else in the world. I don't know a lot much about the other Pro Discus discs out there. Um, DG Weekly did a few reviews years ago. That's basically 100% of the extent of my knowledge on the, on the brand overall. So that's frustrating. We'll see where Kevin goes. I think DD would be a perfect fit for him. I really do. I think he'd go in there. He'd be their top player. He would have a huge base of plastic to pick from. And uh, I think they would do so much more work to make Kevin a known person within the community and uh, make him his own kind of personal brand and give him that backing that he, that he definitely deserves. So anyway, end rant on that one. Paul Ulibarri, I think, is likely to move on. Um, personal opinion, I think it's likely we'll see Paul move on, and we might see him move back to where he was when I first got involved with the, with the sport, which is Discraft. We'll see what happens. Now, talking about Discraft and people named Paul, here's where things get crazy, and I'm sure if you guys are involved in this. Let me take, check my time here. If you guys are involved in the disc golf community, and I'm sure you've heard the rumors that there's a huge money deal on the table and that it's apparently quite likely that Paul Macbeth 
may go to Team Discraft. I have heard a number of different things regarding this. Nothing is confirmed. Who knows? But I'm just going to say it, and I don't think it's, I don't think it's outlandish to say, if Paul Macbeth moves from Innova to Discraft, it will be the single biggest change, and like the the most high profile move in the history of the sport. I've talked about on this show, um, both by myself and also with Robert McCall, about the really interesting time in disc golf that some of you newer players probably don't remember because it was before your time. When Prodigy first released, they signed Ricky, they brought in Kale, Big Germ, Nico, Katrina, Paige Pierce. Um, they took all these, Will Shoestrick moved there, and they had all these great players found Prodigy. Paul Ulibarri was on that um, initial team there as well and has been there since. Um, and then you also had Dynamic Discs become a manufacturer, have their own plastic, being produced by Latitude 64, and we saw Eric McCabe and a number of other players move and stick with, kind of stay with the Dynamic Discs, but move their plastic over to the Trilogy branded Latitude produced plastic. Um, and this was a this is a big deal when this happened. A lot of people left Discraft, a lot of people left Innova, and it really shook up everything. This was, it was a really big, interesting move. Aside from that, and and definitely in terms of a single player. This would be the craziest thing that ever happened within the, the disc golf world of sponsorships and deals for plastic. Paul Macbeth going anywhere is just almost beyond belief. And if the so many rumors weren't out there, I would just totally dismiss this. But I think there's enough smoke that there's something to this. There's enough there's enough of this talk that there's something to it. Whether it happens or not, we will see. I don't know. If I had to bet right now, I think it happens, guys. <laughs> if I had to bet right now, I think it happens. And I think it's going to be absolutely bananas when it does happen. Here are some things to consider. They're talking about a bunch of money for Paul. Are they going to see that return in sales? I don't really know. I don't think... If, if the numbers are correct, we're I think they're saying millions of dollars... Um, like 1 million per season for a few years or something like that. Are they going to see that return in sales? I don't really think so. I actually think that there are going to be a lot of players that are really invested in Innova and are big Paul kind of Innova fans that are going to be more upset with Paul than they more likely to just be like, screw Paul, he's a traitor, than I'm going to move my entire bag to Discraft to support Paul. We'll probably see a little of both, but I think it'll lean more towards people feeling like Paul has somehow betrayed the brand or one of those silly kind of uh, team loyalty things that humans are so stupid about and have been throughout history. We've always been really dumb about our team and hatred towards the other teams and stuff. We're very tribal. We're very nat nationalistic. It's a very human thing to do that. So I think we're going to see a lot of people just say, oh, Paul's a traitor. He bailed us. He's a sellout, whatever. I'm all about Greg Barsby. I'm all about Nate Sexton, and I'm going to keep throwing my plastic, and I'm going to take all my Paul rocks and Paul destroyers out of my bag and all that kind of stuff. Unfortunately, I think that's going to happen. There are definitely going to be some huge Paul fans that are going to then take a look at some Discraft plastic. Again, this is all speculative, and if this happens, um, I think we'll see that. I think we'll see some Paul fans that will be like, sweet, that's cool. Maybe it'll open some doors and some more people will try Discraft. I think if they are going to try to swoop in and take Paul to Team Discraft... It's a long-term move. This is a long-term investment that Discraft is trying to set down the foundations of trying to attempt to once again be in the discussion for the top brand in disc golf. They've really let it slip. They've had some unfortunate situations. Some, I believe their, their media person passed away. And <clears throat> I was quite vocal here on my own channel about the complete lack of content from Discraft, very similar to what I talked about um, with Kevin Jones and Prodiscus earlier. Discraft was doing the same thing. They had 
big high profile move for Val Jenkins to come over to their team. No in the bag, no videos, no nothing. They've kind of rectified some of that now where we've seen some more videos and featuring more of their players. We've seen some in the bags. We've seen some disc reviews. They're trying to do better. The, the reviews that they have produced, um, p- particularly the Heat review with uh, Cody Britton, I believe his name was. Uh, I forget if that's... I'm, I might be getting that name wrong. Phenomenal review. Just top quality, amazing, amazing stuff. So good on them. They need to do that. They should be doing that. We're in the era where you have access to the most powerful marketing tools in the history of Earth. Everyone has it on your phone, on your on your PC. It's, it's that simple. Put the content out there. It's not that hard to do. Um, we're seeing Discraft do that, and I think if they're going to swoop in and try to take Paul, they know it's going to be at a loss for a certain period of time in an attempt to establish a foundation that they can then build upon to become the next top brand out there and try to maybe out overtake Innova or at least kind of get on a more level playing field with them. I don't know the numbers, but I would have to think that Innova has been smoking them over the last several years in terms of sales and uh, just, no, I mean, for, for sure, if we're talking about the amount of players throwing each company's plastic, it's not even a contest, but there are far more players out there throwing Innova than there are Discraft. I think that's unfortunate, just based on the fact that Discraft makes incredible stuff, and they always have. I've been a huge supporter of Discraft over my entire career, mostly because when I started playing, they made the content. And we're seeing the same thing happen with Dynamic Discs now, where Dynamic Discs is putting out this content, instructional stuff, fun stuff, Goofy videos, tour videos, behind the scenes stuff, the podcasting, all the different things. They're bringing in new players into the sport that are starting already loyal to Dynamic Discs because they enjoy the content, because they felt as though they were provided something that was beneficial to them with instructional content or with anything along those lines. And they get brought in, and now they're loyal, and that fan base is is set. That's how it was with me and Discraft. When I first started, Discraft had the clinic videos. They had one on driving, they had one on Anheuser shots, long-range putting, etc. And that is what got me into Discraft Plastic. That content on YouTube that I found, that I found to be beneficial, helped me out. That's what made me want to throw their plastic, and part of the reason why I still throw it today. If I were to go out and play disc golf right now, which I kind of want to do after all this rambling, I'm going to be putting with magnets. I'm going to be throwing my thrashers off the tee. I have a bunch of Latitude and DD plastic mixed in there as well. Um, And honestly, more of that than Discraft at this point, but two absolutely core essential molds to my bag are still Discraft, and I love and respect them as a manufacturer. They make incredible stuff. And I think, if nothing else, the talk of Paul going over there maybe is good alone. Maybe if he doesn't even go there, maybe just the talk that that could have happened opens the door for more people to take a look at some of that plastic and see what it's all about. They've done a lot of work um, with getting more media out there. I think it's paying off. They've always made great plastic. Their new plastic types are looking amazing, and it's all good there, so we'll see. I think it'll be good for everybody. If more of the manufacturers put out that content and vie for spots. I think that's good for everybody. And I think the more competition drives the market in different ways, makes these manufacturers continue to try to innovate the products, which brings us better plastic, better discs to throw, more options to throw out there on the course, more plastic for me to review. Um, And it's just good for everybody. So let's see what happens. Kind of uh, me and Andy have been speculating as to what Paul might carry if he moves over like is he going is he going to throw buzzes is the fact that he was not throwing a nova at the hall of fame classic perhaps a tip or some type of clue that he may be considering a move because the nova out of all the discs that I've tested over the years might be the single most difficult disc to replace out of anything that I've tried It's super unique. It feels like nothing else on the market. It flies in a very specific manner, and you're not going to find a Nova out of Discraft at all. So he's throwing like a Glow Aviar. You could definitely find a replacement for that on Discraft. He was throwing that at the Hall of Fame Classic. Is that perhaps a little clue 
that we could point to as something that might be um, something to think about here? It could be. It could very well be. So it's interesting. It's fun to speculate about. Um, we'll see. If the move is confirmed, I think it would be fun. Maybe me and Andy will submit what we think his bag will be. Um, and then uh, something like that. We could kind of guess as to what his bag is going to be. Lock that in. I'll, I'll post it as a video and then we'll see what actually happens. Uh, for damn sure, if Paul moves to Discraft, they better just work him to death for promotion. He better be doing disc reviews. His in the bag better come out real soon. All that kind of stuff. If they're going to get the value for money out of him, they're going to have to work in a lot of media obligations to make it worth their while, as far as I'm concerned. Him just being out there with the, with the shirt on and throwing the plastic all season, I don't think is quite enough for the kind of money we're talking about here. They're going to have to use him, and they should use him. Um, there's no other reason to do it, in my opinion, to try to spend all this money if you're not going to use him in that in that manner. So we should see him in the bag relatively quickly. Again, all hypothetical. It'd be kind of fun to try to guess. I don't know. I don't know if we'll see him throw buzzes. I think a zone is a lock. I think he'll definitely be throwing zones. I think he'll probably throw like a heat to replace his Roadrunner for rollers. Right? He throws Roadrunner rollers at this point, I believe. He'll probably throw a heat for rollers. It's my guess. Man, what else? I don't know. He'll probably putt with Challengers or maybe the Challenger SS. Very AVR-esque disc. Maybe he'll have a new release come out. Maybe that's part of the deal. Is he'll have a kind of a rock type, more rock type disc come out on the market that he can throw. Um, there'll be a new, brand new signature mold for him. Is he going to go Punishers? Is he going to go Forces? All this kind of stuff is fun for me as a plastic nerd. All right, guys. I'm going to let you go. That was a lot of rambling. My voice is about to give out on me. I'm about an hour deep here. My coffee's almost gone. I must be strong because I was, uh, I was going quick there. Much love to everybody out there. Thank you for your continued support of my channel. I appreciate each and every one of you who listen to this stuff. Watch the videos. You're all important to me. I could and would not continue to do this without you guys supporting the content with your views, with your likes, with your subscriptions. I appreciate you very much. I hope this message finds you well. Let me know how you're doing in the comments. Let me know what you think of what we talked about with the reviews. Do you think Paul's going to go? Do you think it's crazy? Do you think he'll throw buzzes if he moves over there? Tell me what you got. Much love. I'll check you guys soon. Cheers. Mm -hmm.